Today, we're addressing a topic that touches the deepest chords of our existence. What happens when we die? For decades, every time near-death experiences or NDEs were discussed, the most common response, almost a conditioned reflex, has been, it's just the brain shutting down, its lack of oxygen, their hallucinations, epileptic seizures, a cocktail of crazy brain chemistry. What if I told you that a new, rigorous scientific review published this very year in 2025 has taken all these explanations and dismantled them one by one, piece by piece, using decades of real data? We're not talking about anecdotes, but an academic article published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal written by two of the world's leading experts in the field. This study not only challenges our certainties, but could force science to reconsider the very nature of consciousness. This is the type of information you'll hardly find elsewhere because it shakes the foundations of many dogmas. But if you're here, it's because you're looking for serious and up-to-date answers. And today, we'll analyze this revolutionary study in detail. Before diving into this incredible analysis, I ask for your small but fundamental support. This is the type of content that requires hours of research and analysis. If you appreciate this free, serious, and unbiased dissemination, the best way to support it is first of all, to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell. Second, leave a like and a comment, even just to say, I'm here, or interesting. It's a free gesture for you, but for the YouTube algorithm, it's essential to show this video to more people. Now let's begin. So, where do we start? Let's start with the enemy. For years, skeptics have proposed various theories to explain NDEs. Recently, a group of researchers tried to create the summa of all these theories. They published a model called Neptune, an acronym that stands for Neurophysiological Evolutionary Psychological Theory, Understanding Near-Death Experience. This Neptune model was an admirable attempt to bring order. It took every single popular neurological explanation and put it in one package. Lack of oxygen, hypoxia, excess CO2, temporal lobe activity, epileptic seizures, temporary parietal junction stimulation, REM phase intrusion, ketamine-like chemistry, and even the so-called electrical spikes in the dying brain. It seemed like the definitive explanation, the tombstone on the subject. But then, in October 2025, two scientists from the University of Virginia, Dr. Bruce Grayson and Marietta Pelevanova, published a response. The article is titled, A Neuroscientific Model of Near-Death Experiences Reconsidered. It was published in the scientific journal, Psychology of Consciousness, Theory, Research, and Practice of the American Psychological Association. These are not random names. Bruce Grayson is a psychiatrist and professor emeritus at the University of Virginia, considered one of the fathers of near-death experience research, a figure of absolute scientific rigor. This article is important because it's perhaps the first time that science, at this level, systematically dismantles all materialist explanations in one fell swoop, demonstrating that, put together, they still don't explain the phenomenon. As I was telling you, few talk about it because it's uncomfortable. It goes against the dominant narrative that everything begins and ends in the brain. But we're here to analyze the data without dogmas, and the data says very interesting things. Grayson and Peklavanova take the Neptune model and analyze it point by point. Let's see what they discovered. Point one, oxygen and CO2 levels. The classic theory, lack of oxygen, hypoxia, or excess carbon dioxide, hypercapnia, cause hallucinations. The response from Grayson and Pechlevanova, based on real studies, is clear. 
Many studies on patients who had cardiac arrest show that those who reported a near-death experience had, in reality, comparable or even higher oxygen levels compared to patients who reported nothing, and they often had lower or comparable CO2 levels. But there's an even stronger data point. Hypoxia, true lack of oxygen, is known to doctors. It doesn't produce lucid experiences. It produces confusion, disorientation, fragmentation of thoughts, and amnesia. Near-death experiences are the exact opposite. They are hyper-structured, clear, lucid, coherent experiences, and are remembered as more real than reality itself, often for a lifetime. Therefore, the lack of air explanation is not only unsupported by the data, but describes symptoms opposite to those of near-death experiences. Point two, the temporal lobe and epileptic seizures. This is another great classic. It's just an epileptic seizure in the temporal lobe. Grayson and Palivanova analyze the literature. What happens to patients with temporal lobe epilepsy? Their seizures, when they produce experiences, are almost always fragmented, bizarre, sometimes frightening. They are never the coherent, peaceful, and transformative experiences of near-death experiences. The researchers cite a specific study conducted on 100 epileptic patients, 0%, 0, reported experiences that match the criteria of a near-death experience. In fact, they cite the epileptologist Ernst Rodan, who, despite favoring a neurological explanation, admitted, despite having seen hundreds of patients with temporal lobe seizures, I have never encountered that symptomatology as part of a seizure. Epileptic seizures, by definition, interrupt normal brain processing. They don't produce hyperlucidity, coherent life reviews, or veridical perceptions. The theory simply collapses in the face of clinical data. Point three, temporoparietal junction stimulation. This is a more recent theory. By electrically stimulating a specific point in the brain, strange sensations can be induced, such as feeling out of body or perceiving a shadow presence. Skeptics rejoiced, see? Out-of-body experiences are just a brain glitch. But Grayson and Palavanova, analyzing those same studies, show that the induced experiences are not at all like the OBEs of NDEs. When the brain is stimulated, patients report illusions. They feel like they're floating, but their perception remains anchored to the physical body. The shadow presence they feel is static, not interactive. In true near-death experiences, instead, people report actually leaving the body, floating above it, seeing the room from an external perspective, for example, from the ceiling, and, crucially, describing veridical events they couldn't have seen or heard. They report details of medical procedures, conversations of staff in the hallway, specific objects that are then confirmed. Stimulation has never produced an accurate and verifiable perception from the outside. The former are illusions, the latter behave like real perceptions. Point four, ketamine and psychedelic substances. This is another idea. Perhaps the brain, at the point of death, produces substances similar to ketamine or DMT that create the experience. The article points out something very interesting. The same scientist who first developed the ketamine theory for near-death experiences, Carl Jansen, after years of study, abandoned it. Jansen concluded that ketamine is just another door to similar experiences, but it's not the cause of near-death experiences. Ketamine experiences, in fact, don't produce the same permanent transformative effects don't include accurate veridical perceptions and don't correspond to the deep structure of near-death experiences. They may share a sensation, an atmosphere, but they're not the same thing. Point five, REM phase intrusion. The idea is that the brain, under stress, makes intrusion of the REM phase, the dream phase, 
into the waking state, creating hallucinations. Here too, the criticism is twofold and devastating. First, REM intrusion, like sleep paralysis, is almost always accompanied by fear, terror, paralysis, and hallucinations of threatening entities. Near-death experiences are the opposite, predominantly peaceful, characterized by love and lucidity. Second, near-death experiences often occur during general anesthesia or cardiac arrest. In these conditions, brain activity is so suppressed that the REM phase isn't even possible. Point six, the electrical spikes of the dying brain. This is the most recent and popular skeptical theory, based on a couple of studies that detected gamma wave spikes in the brains of dying patients. There it is, they said. That's the explosion of consciousness. Grayson and Palavanova analyzed those studies and everything falls apart. First, in those studies, the monitored patients were not in cardiac arrest. Their hearts were still beating. Second, none of the patients who showed those spikes were conscious. None subsequently reported any experience or awareness. Third, the authors note that many of those spikes could simply be artifacts due to scalp muscle spasms, a known problem. But the coup de grace comes with the analysis of Sam Parnia's 2023 AWARE-2 study. This study monitored patients in cardiac arrest, and you know what it found? It found that there was a total lack of overlap. The patients who showed those famous consciousness-like spikes did not report near-death experiences. And the patients who reported near-death experiences did not show those EEG spikes. Grayson and Palavanova's article concludes that this is proof of the exact opposite. Those electrical spikes are not a biomarker of near-death experiences. The devastating conclusion of the Neptune model. After dismantling every single pillar, Grayson and Palavanova thrust the knife. They argue that the Neptune model and all materialist theories casually ignore the strongest and most difficult to explain evidence, things the model doesn't even mention. What are they? Accurate and verified out-of-body perceptions. People meeting deceased relatives they didn't even know had died. How does the brain hallucinate information it doesn't possess? Seeing events happening in other rooms then confirmed. Radical and permanent personality changes. Life reviews that include detailed memories that had been completely forgotten. The omission of this data, the authors say, is glaring. The key point of the entire article is this. The physiological ideas that have been relied upon for years don't hold up when confronted with the real data of near-death experiences. None of them. And putting together many weak explanations doesn't create a strong explanation. The conclusion of the University of Virginia researchers is a sentence that carries enormous scientific weight. They say, I quote, brain activity alone cannot explain the fundamental and distinctive characteristics of near-death experiences. Near-death experiences, they say, clearly occur during periods of severely compromised or absent brain function, yet the experiences are too structured, too coherent, and sometimes too verifiable to be dismissed as random neural noise. Of course, they admit there are still points to clarify. This study is not the final word, but it's a giant step forward. It demonstrates scientifically that simplistic explanations based only on the dying brain are insufficient. And now, let's enter the most fascinating part. We must be careful, as always, and distinguish what the study says from what are philosophical speculations. The study demonstrates the insufficiency of materialist models. It doesn't prove the existence of an afterlife, but it opens incredible doors. If consciousness, as these data suggest, is not exclusively a product of brain activity, then what is it? If the mind can function, perceive lucidly, remember and have transformative experiences when the brain is off or severely compromised.
What does this tell us about the nature of reality? Grayson and Pelivanova, in their article, point out something crucial. The authors of the Neptune model admitted from the beginning that they excluded dualistic theories, those that separate mind and brain, because they started from the assumption, from the fundamental dogma of neuroscience, that human experience arises from the brain. But our authors counter that this is not a fundamental dogma, but a philosophy assumed a priori, physicalism, or materialism. It's a hypothesis, not a proven fact. What if the hypothesis is wrong? What if the brain is not the producer of consciousness, but rather a receiver, a sort of antenna or a filter that tunes consciousness and anchors it to this three-dimensional reality? What would happen if, at the moment of cardiac arrest, this antenna shuts off? Consciousness, instead of vanishing, would be freed from the filter, allowing it to access a broader reality. This is speculation, of course, but it's a speculation that aligns with the data much better than neurological theories. It would explain veridical out-of-body perceptions, consciousness, no longer limited by eyes and ears, directly perceives reality. It would explain the encounter with deceased relatives. Consciousness accesses a non-local informational dimension. It would explain the life review, where time seems to collapse and every event is reviewed simultaneously. This challenges our linear conception of space and time, suggesting that perhaps everything exists now. This 2025 study doesn't give us the final answer, but it does something even more important. It scientifically validates the question. It tells us that reducing humanity's deepest experiences to a simple brain malfunction is not only reductive, it's scientifically inaccurate. It forces us, as researchers and as human beings, to remain open not to close ourselves in materialist dogmas and to continue investigating one of the greatest mysteries, who or what we truly are. Here we are at the end of this journey. I hope this analysis has given you a measure of how much science is evolving on these topics. We started from the classic view of near-death experiences as simple brain malfunctions. We saw how the Neptune model attempted to unify all these theories. And then we analyzed, point by point, how the new 2025 scientific review by Grayson and Pelivanova rigorously dismantled these explanations, one by one, using the data. From the lack of oxygen that actually causes confusion, not lucidity, to epileptic seizures that don't produce coherent experiences, from brain stimulation that creates illusions, not real perceptions, to the electrical spikes that data in hand don't correlate at all with near-death experiences. The conclusion of this highly important study is that physiological explanations alone are insufficient to explain the complexity, coherence, and veridical perceptions reported in near-death experiences, which often occur in a state of absent or compromised brain function. This leaves us in a new place, a place where science is forced to look beyond its own philosophical prejudices and admit that the relationship between mind and brain is much more complex and mysterious than we thought. We don't have all the answers, but now we have the scientific validation to ask better questions. If this type of in-depth analysis, based on data and free from dogmas, is what you're looking for, I invite you again to support this channel. Subscription is the first step, but if you really want to help me continue this dissemination mission, leave a like and a comment. They are vital. Finally, remember that all links are in the description. Thank you for accompanying me in this analysis.